This is the Brain Chip Podcast. Hear from our thought leaders about neuromorphic computing, beneficial AI, and how Brain Chip's Akita is pushing AI to the edge. This podcast is a place for investors, practitioners, and anyone interested in the future of AI. Well, thank you for uh, for joining our podcast. Uh, as many of you know, uh, as I, I talked about in our last podcast, uh, Peter Vandermade, uh, one of our founders, uh, tr- truly our founder, uh, is going to join us today. Uh, he doesn't need much of an introduction because I think most of you know him very well. Um, but Peter, uh, thank you for joining. And uh, also thank the audience, all of our constituents for joining. If you don't mind, Peter, I'd like to ask a few questions. Uh, we can go back and forth and you know you can expand on uh, and any subject that, uh, that you feel is appropriate. One of the things that uh, our investors, uh, editors, analysts are uh, interested about is that over the course of your career, you've been inspired by the way the brain processes and how to translate that functionality into technology. Can you, t- can you tell the audience what led you to this path? It was not just the brain. Um, I think the, uh, the human body is an incredible creation. It, uh, in, uh, in my previous uh, co- company, I used the, uh, the immune system. I copied the uh, immune system as a, as a model for a, a computer immune system. That, uh, that technology is now owned by IBM. The um, brain with 86 billion neural cells and 100 trillion Synaptic connections is faster than a giant supercomputer. It runs on the equivalent of just 20 watts. So, uh, as a, even as a kid, I always uh, took things apart to see how they work, and and I was fascinated by the function of the human brain. If you consider that, uh, if you uh, try to determine if something, if if some code is viral or not, and you do a, a behavior analysis of that code. You can immediately see that something is wrong, that it's not, not a normal program. But to do that with the, with the neural networks of the 1990s, it was, it was a real challenge. So I thought there had to be a better way, and that's why, it, uh, why we started Friendship. So I, I, I did something very similar as, as, a, as a young man. I took things apart to see how they worked. And I'm curious, I never put them back together. <laughs> so, so my my I I have a I have a younger sister who's, who has things that I've torn apart just to see how they worked and never put them back together. It appears to me that through what you've uh, accomplished at Brainship, you put them back together, but in a different way. Uh, yes, yeah. As a kid, I spent long hours at the library to make sure that uh, I could things put 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 things back together. Uh, or I would get into trouble with my parents. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Things> apart. <laughs> so, uh, so what was your what was your your fundamental inspiration to start Brainchip? Um, I, I know about ISS and uh, you know the sell to IBM, but this was a this was a uh, a major a major task a major challenge uh, to, to to take what you you believe to be a great concept and turn it into a company. Yes, yeah. uh, in my previous company uh, was sold to ISS and subsequently to IBM in 2004, and I was looking for something new to do. In, before I even started that company, I, uh, I looked at neural circuits and I tried to emulate a neural circuit with a, a small processing core, something that I built for my, uh, my graphics accelerator in 1983. The idea then was to uh, put lots of those cores on one chip, that's uh, something that Spinnaker at the University of Manchester are now doing with the, with the ARM cores. At the same time, smartphones were becoming more prominent. And I basically thought, okay, what do I do? Do I um, do something in mobile phones or add-ons for mobile phones or, or do something with uh, technology and neuromorphic networks? So I prayed about that and the, uh, the, the choice was made to uh, to look at neuromorphic networks. I very soon found out that I didn't know enough, enough about neurology and uh, I had to go, do an in-depth study to really understand how the brain works and, and implement it as a, as a circuit. Could you describe for our audience 
when we talk about neuromorphic computing, you know, versus the historical von Neumann architecture, what are the differences and how could they be applied in the future? Yeah, that comes back also to the nature of our product. It's very different from, uh, from the math accelerators that, you, that are being marketed as, as neural network chips. The basic difference is that we implement the entire neural circuit, including the, the connections between the neurons called synapses, which are memory. The, the process only has to pass data to our chip to, uh, to get a process. So if you're looking at the, uh, the structure of a, of a neural network in, in the brain, it uh, consists of, of cells that are specialized and, and, and uh, communicate with one another. Uh, they store information. They, each, each neuron basically is a, is, is a, is a small computer that, that starts recognizing patterns. Um, in general, or in the, in the past, that this has been done on, uh, by, by computer program simulations. Um, all the other chips that are out there are just speeding up the, the processing of those, uh, of those algorithms, while our chip is uh, processing the algorithm in its entirely. So, you know, we, we, we've talked uh, many times uh, publicly and, of course, in, internally in our strategic planning about beneficial AI, you know, the, the ability to improve the, the um, you know, improve society, improve humankind. Can you give us a little sense of how, how you think we can accomplish that and, and what that might look like? I think it's very important that we, we focus on, on beneficial AI, things that, that, uh, that enhance uh, or are better for, for, for society. The brain chip technology we can use, for instance, in medical diagnostics. It's one, one strong area of, of attention for us. Um, we have demonstrated in the lab that we can diagnose COVID-19, for instance, by using a sensor that is sensitive to the organic compounds in a, an exhaled breath. Exhaled breath has uh, as many disease indicators as a blood test, but it's much less invasive. We're planning to uh, expand the scope to include many of the of other diseases that the sensors, sensors can detect, such as different uh, types of cancer. In the future, I think every medical home, uh, every medical uh, kit in home should have, uh, have one of these so we can catch diseases long before they, they become a, a major problem. That's one example of a beneficial AI application where um, Akida is looking at the, the compounds that, that are present in the breath and then classify that as either a, a normal uh, pattern or a, a pattern that indicates uh, a serious disease. Let me let me ask you this. You know, over, over the past um, let's let's call it ten years, uh, maybe maybe even a little bit more. Um, no pun intended. We we have focused as a industry in the semiconductor world on the trade-off between Moore's law and our ability to, you know, re re reduce the geometries. Um, so, you know, Moore's law was doubling every two years, the geom was, was the, the premise. Uh, and as geometry shrunk, you could get away with that because you could, you could jack up clock speeds while you were offsetting um, the ability to have more gates, more transistors. How is how is AI and and more specifically, how does more not neuromorphic um, implementation change the technology advancement? And does it does it break does it break Moore's law and and the uh, you know the the clock speeds that are necessary to implement AI in a traditional matrix multiplication way? Yes. It, uh... It's a completely different technology. So if you're looking at computer technology where you have a processor that goes and fetches instructions and then executes those instructions, that, uh, that technology has plateaued. You can't go smaller or faster anymore. So they're putting more and more, more cores on, on, a, on a single chip. The, the processor cores have not seen any uh, major architectural or speed advance, uh, advances over the last 10 years. As you, as you mentioned, it, uh, the computer technology has, has reached a ceiling. You can't, you can't go beyond the physical constraints of silicon. Neuromorphic technology, on the other hand, has a huge potential for growth and advancement. We are in the early stages of this technology, and the future looks really exciting. 
it's basically so, a refresh. It's not so much a uh, throwing Moore's law out of the out of the window, but it's a refresh of the, of, of the of, of Moore's law in a completely different ar architecture. Mm -hmm. So, so where where do you think um, brain chip us? You know, we're we're in the, we're in this together. Um, where do you think it fits into the future of advancement? Uh, and we we have introduced the the Akita device. Uh, and it's been well well received. But, but what do you what do you see the future for? Uh, for uh, we'll call it the Akita platform. But how does it mature into the future? Uh, what what kind of ideas uh, do you have as our chief technology officer about where we could be? Yeah, we are right at the beginning of this of this evolution. Uh, Brainchip uh, Akita is a, is a great product. It can be used across a large number of industries, and uh, we have great expectations of this product. But um, it's it's the first of, of, of a of a new generation of of, of uh, technology of, of devices that are going to be following that uh, will incre incrementally um, add more features of the brain uh, and therefore um, expand its uh, its uh, intelligence. Take an example of uh, some, something that happened in the past is that a plastic bag was blowing across the street and uh, an autonomous driving car uh, sees an object and uh, takes evasive action and, uh, and, and kills the driver. That is, that is drastic and, and uh, that's a direct result of, of the way that current uh, uh, neural networks run on, on standard computer technology with accelerators that um, that increases speed but don't make the system any smarter. So if you can look at the behavior of that of, of, of that plastic bag, you see it blowing across the street. You know it's just a plastic bag and not a, not a rock. A rock doesn't blow across the street. So if they, these these objects behave in different ways. But you have to look at the sequence of events to understand that. And that's the sort of thing that we're looking at for the future of future devices in our, our Akita that they can interpret these sequences of events. And say, okay, this behavior indicates that this is, this is a very light object and we can just run over it. Well, um, the same thing with a ball rolling out of it on, the, on the street. You see the ball moving across the street. You know that uh, if there's a ball rolling on the street, there could be a kid behind it. And the, the, the system can predict that if you see one object, the next object is going to follow and it learns how to do that. It doesn't have to be programmed. So that's a, that's a very... Um, large difference with what, what AI is capable of uh, today, uh, otherwise known as AGI, Artificial General Intelligence. And that, that is uh, the direction that we will want to be heading in the, in the future. Let me, let me, let me ask you a, 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 quick, a quick question so we can sum up, because I, I think this is, uh, it's, it's been a great opportunity for all of our constituents to, to hear you, uh, which I, I know they enjoy and, and they find educating. Yeah, you know your book, higher higher intelligence. I've I've always had a concept that I've tried to you know tried to move forward that data is data is a foundation. Data needs to be translated into information. Is data data itself is you you know what it looks like you, you you've seen files upon files upon files of data, data needs to be translated into information so that you could gain knowledge, and turn that knowledge in the power to take action. Uh, what research and how uh, closely are 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 we to that point where we take data, turn it into information, create knowledge and have the power to take action. Even in, uh, in the first Akita that we have, it, uh, the, the, the system is learning. Uh, therefore, as it learns, it creates, it creates knowledge, internal knowledge that is stored within, the, uh, within the, net, the neural network in Akita. That process of uh, creating knowledge and, uh, from, from input data uh, is, is basically what the, what the brain does as well. It, uh, you, you perceive uh, information or, or data basically <laughs> through, through your eyes, ears, and, and, and feelings, and tastes, and, and smells. And um, 
it's it's represented in a different way in biology, but it's still data, and the brain interprets that the information and and uh, and learns from it, uh, learns from it, and uh, stores the information as a model of the world, and then that model of the world is used to perceive and and, and interpret what what is uh, what is happening in the, in the in the world at in real time. So we need to get to a system in the future whereby uh, information is, is used. Uh, for instance, if we are, if I'm sitting here in my chair, I know the position of the desk, I know the position of my computer. It's not just a 2D image we, we, we are interpreting, it's a 3D model of the world. That is where, that's the vision of, 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 of um, where Akita will be evolving over, over, uh, over the next uh, five, five years. So you see, you see subsequent generations. Uh, uh, um, I should ask this as a question: Do you see, because we've talked about this many times, subsequent generations of let's call it the Akita architecture? And I think everybody at this point knows Akita means uh, spike in Greek. But moving from our first generation, Akita one, which is the ADK one thousand, uh, to a second generation, which will have more learning capacity into Akita generation three that may have even more learning capacity, uh, you know, based on kind of our, our mirroring, um, I'll say mirroring rather than mimicking, uh, trying to mirror uh, the, the functionality of how a, how a brain or a, you know, the, the brain of a human being or the brain generally would work. Yes, yes. As we are evolving, we are setting our targets higher. And the next uh, generations of Akita will be, uh, what we're looking at at the moment and things that are happening in the lab are, are cortical neuromorphic networks where uh, we are uh, copying the uh, architecture of the, of the neocortex. Uh, at the moment, uh, deep learning systems basically copy the, uh, the inner part of the brain where you have a, an input and the input always uh, gives you the same reaction. You know, you get uh, you get a stimulus like a, a, a needle or something like that. You you pull back your hand because it's it, it hurts your finger. That is a reaction that is happening every time you do the same thing. Uh, current uh, deep learning systems always do the same thing because they are taking a, a bunch of pixels and classify that as a as, an, as a feature. And then if enough features are present, it says, okay, this is the action that we have it's to take. A, it's a, a system that is uh, responding to, a, to, a, to an input in the same way in every, every case. Well, the brain doesn't do that. The brain, if you, go, if you have to think about things, you may come to a different conclusion. So the outer, outer part of the brain, the cortex, is where we do our thinking in the frontal lobe. That you may make a different decision, even though you get the same input. I'd like you to maybe add, as as we move to the next generation or two of Akita, and particularly with respect to cortical networks, uh, the ability to have a predictive capability, um, which is really hard, really hard to accomplish, and it's one of the most amazing things about the human brain is you don't, you don't know when you take your next step. You don't think about uh, when you take your next step. Are you walking down the hallway or are you taking, um, you're going down a stairway? Um, you, you, the human brain has already figured that out and has predicted that well in advance so that you know, you know, muscularly you, you, know, you can accomplish that. Is that really possible uh, to derive in silicon? Yes, I believe that is possible. If we're copying the same architecture of the brain into silicon, it should behave in the same way. Uh, for instance, we are looking at cortical columns. Cortical columns project to other cortical columns. And at first, uh, one cortical column will project to maybe 100 cortical columns that are around it and broadcast the information that it just has just seen something. Uh, and then, the next event that happens triggers one of those columns, one of those hundred columns, triggers that column. Now the connections between that first column and the second column are, are strengthened. So the, 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 the cortex has learned that 
this action, this first action, is always followed by the next action. And that's how the brain learns to sequence things. Now, there may be two or three columns that are responding. And then there's a, 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 a window, what was called a window take all, and a voting system, which, which one is right. So the one with the, with the highest number of, uh, of uh, weights, or basically connections between the, between the two columns, will, uh, will have the strongest response and therefore win the, the contest. The, these things are, are uh, influenced by many other things, such as opinions and, and, and feelings and the, the time of the day, and whatever, whatever is going on in the world. And uh, I really believe we need to copy uh, these architectures of the brain in, in the same way, because we only have one model, one model of an intelligent system, and that's the human brain. Uh, scientists have been trying to reinvent intelligence for the last uh, 70 years and failed. And if you're looking at what Akita 1 has already accomplished in that it can learn, uh, for instance, with the demo that we have on our website where you show the tiger and it learns that it is a tiger and then it can recognize a tiger and every image you showed after that, even if you have turned the tiger upside down or any, 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 any angle. So what we have accomplished with Akita 1 is already something that is that, that people have been trying to do for, for, for many decades and failed. And we have succeeded in that. Taking this, uh, this, this, uh, this concept further into, uh, into a, co a columnar architecture with, with prediction, our brains are always uh, a few milliseconds ahead of what's happening in the world. We constantly predict what's going to come next. And that works for the principle that I just explained is that one column co projects all the columns around it constantly. And therefore, as it projects the information to other columns, it, it learns sequences, constantly learns sequences. You can retrace the, the steps to your car and where you parked it because your brain has stored that sequence as you, when, when you parked your car and walked to the office, it has stored that sequence and therefore you can recall that sequence and go back to your car. Same thing if you're walking down the steps, your foot already knows where the next step is. Yes. Yeah, so, so listen, I, I, I think we've, you know, we, we've explained a lot and, you know, it's been a little bit of a technical deep dive, uh, reinforced learning, predictive uh, capability is really, uh, you know, what's coming around the corner, Akita one, Generation one has already accomplished a great deal. Uh, we have, you know, second generation architectures uh, that you, you are already working on at the Research Institute in uh, Perth. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining the podcast. I'd like to thank Peter for joining the podcast. And again, it's a little bit of a technical deep dive, uh, but I, 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 do, I do believe that all of our constituents, whether it's analysts, investors, even our employees, uh, appreciate you joining this podcast and uh, giving a description of where AI is today, particularly with respect to brain chip, uh, and what they might expect in the future. So I'd like to thank everybody, and uh, we'll catch up on the next podcast. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Brain Chip Podcast. Please remember to rate and review on your favorite podcast platform.